Hello and welcome back. Today we are here with a very special and tenacious Dotsie Bausch. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me. You are a powerhouse and such a bright light. You are an eight-time National Cycling Championship winner, two-time Pan American gold medalist, Olympic silver medalist, Switch for Good founder, and co-host of the Switch for Good podcast, one of the prominent athletes in the documentary, The Game Changers, you are a national speaker and my dear friend. I love and adore you so stinking much. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> I'm signing up. You're here to be my agent. <laughs> so you have such a profound story and I really want to dive into it. You weren't always as happy and struggled with a very serious eating disorder. Can you share with us how this started and what it was all like? My early 20s, I um, suffered uh, greatly with anorexia and bulimia. But it's, it's hard to starve yourself. So there, were, there was a lot of strength and inner fortitude it took to um, act out on the inner pain that I was experiencing during that time in my life via an eating disorder. Yeah. A lot of people aren't really aware that um, an eating disorder becomes an addiction just like a lot of other addictions, maybe to alcohol or drugs or sex. It's just the, the vehicle that you're using to act out on yeah. um, the strife and the misery and the pain that you're, that you're in. So, um, but healing from that was the life-changing experience for me. And luckily, I was able to and yeah. come back stronger. So where, where do you think the, the pain was coming from? Because I, I actually know your mom and dad and they're, they're incredible human beings. They're angels. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know no human is, is perfect, but they're pretty close to it. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I had an amazing childhood. I know. I can't blame it on that at all. Yeah. <laughs> where did the can't blame it on mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Sorry, mom I, and dad. Can't blame you. I know. <laughs> no, not, not at all. They were wonderful and super supportive of everything I've ever done. But um, I actually was um, graduating college, went to Villanova in Philadelphia, and I had majored in journalism, had done a internship at the local TV station. I was just, I was convinced that I wanted to be like a hard news reporter, yeah. get, like just in the trenches, super gritty, and that's what I wanted to do with my life. And after I did the internship uh, in my senior year of college, after, you know, I'm finishing, I'm graduating in like six months, I recognized that that was not at all what I wanted to do because when I got into it, I recognized how controlled our news is by big yeah. business, the yeah. government, you name it. Uh, and I thought, I don't, you know, that's, that I, I'm not even going to be able to be creative. I, I saw so many really truthful, real stories get crushed, um, you know, never to see the light of day. And so I graduated and owed a lot of money for college and didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And that just started a spiral of... Um, a lack of confidence, a huge amount mm. of fear, um, and uh, just I couldn't find my footing. And so I started to slowly in the beginning just control my food because I was mm -hmm. trying to assert control over something, uh, anything. Yeah. And uh, that that was hard to do and challenging to do. And so I, I, um, I gained a lot of energy from that. I kind of got off on it, yeah. you know, being yeah. able to control. And then it, it, I just kept going. And I, I, I kind of spun out of control in terms of I just – I felt – um, I felt lost and I felt like I didn't have a place in the world. And um, there were some other, you know, extenuating, painful things going on. And so um, it, it's, it's eating disorders can, can, can spiral fast and hard when you least expect it. It's not like I set out to um, starve myself right. or to be right. an anorexic. And it really had nothing to do with um, my outward appearance. I wasn't trying to look a certain way or be hmm. a certain way, but I, it got so bad that I remember feeling like, I don't want anyone to be able to see me anymore. I, I remember trying to disappear. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, you know, so I, I, then I got more connected to how small I was getting because people weren't noticing anymore, and I liked that. You attempted suicide when you were around 22 years old. What, what pushed you to the point, and how did you come out of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, so many people go through this, and so many people mm -hmm. go through it silently, too. And no to doubt. have somebody who's so successful... Um, and so such a powerhouse like you to share, share what you were going through. Mm -hmm. I feel like it will help so many people even silently going through sure. what they're going through. So, um, and be so relatable to them and give them a voice too. And mm -hmm. maybe 
reach out for help somehow. Um, so would you mind sharing like what yeah. brought you to that point of you just wanting to end it? I just felt, I just didn't feel any more hope. And, and I mean, really at the end of the day of all that we have hope, we yeah. need the most. Yeah. And I just, I was just, I just ran out of hope. Like it just had all drained out of me. And I was so tired and sick of myself and being who I was and um, which was not doing anything good for the world, not doing anything good for myself, that's for sure. By that point, I had spiral, spiraled pretty deeply into cocaine addiction. And I was just, you know, I was just worthless. And I felt worthless. And I knew I was worthless because I wasn't, you know, giving anything um, back to our earth. And I don't know what else we're here for, you know, than to, you know, be able to put back what we've been given. And I had been given so much, like you mentioned, like I had an amazing um, family, have an amazing family. And um, so I just was the end of my rope. So I ran out on the 76 yeah. freeway in Philadelphia. And um, you know, I don't know why it didn't work, but it didn't. Because God wasn't done with you. Wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you weren't worthless. Well, yeah, not anymore, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and how did you not die? How did you not die? Yeah, I know. I know. Did somebody I save know. you? Did cars go around you? Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah. You know, when you're in that space, um, you're not incredi incredibly aware or cognizant of what's going on around you. I mean, I was high. I was. I hadn't yeah. eaten in days. And, you know, so there. I have a foggy memory of exactly how I made it to the other side and back. Um, and back. Yeah, because that side of the. 76, like you, yeah, there's, it's like a rock. Well, I mean, yeah, there wasn't really anywhere, anywhere to go on the other side, which is, you know, you're, you're, I, w I remember feeling really disappointed, but um, something spark sparked in, in that, in mm -hmm. that evening or the next morning that um, I scratched my head a little bit and thought, well, I think I'm going to have to figure out something else. After you found help, what was your healing journey like? What specific methods did your therapist give you to overcome your struggle? So you you found a therapist in this, it was Borders Bookstore, right? Yes. Well, it, I went through three therapists before I found this therapist. So okay. a lot of people that, you know, have been through a journey similar to ours um, know that you go through a lot of frogs before you get to yes. and Because the fit has to be there. Not saying they were bad at their know. job, but it was a lot of... Um, what I would consider, I guess, just like traditional clinical therapy where I'm sitting on the other side of the room and they have a pad and they're just doing a lot of, oof, you know, oh. and like, what are you writing? You're judging me. And if you're, a, you know, a doctor, you're so smart, you should be able to put down the pad and just, you know, have a conversation, listen to you. Just all of them were, were like that before. So hmm. I, by that point, I had moved out to uh, Los Angeles and I did. I found an ad in the paper when there used to be papers and the classifieds when there used to be classifieds. I think it was the, um, like the LA Weekly or something. Okay. And um, yeah, she was giving a talk on fear actually mm -hmm. in the basement of a Borders bookstore and I went. And, and, then, um, and what made you, what made you really like her? Did you listen to her speech or did you kind of sense that like, okay, yeah. this is who I need? She's just an extraordinary spirit. You know, those people that you just are like, was well, something's different here. Yeah. I just felt, um, her her piece and I could feel that she had um, just great ability hmm. and, and she was she definitely meant to do what she does. So I went up to her afterwards. I was like, "Do you do do you do private sessions?" Because I'm at the end of my rope, and she did, and we got started. And it it was uh, it was a bit rocky in the beginning, but I knew from just the first five seconds of our first meeting that this was going to be the right match for me because I had tried a lot of other matches on, like I mentioned. But she used a really, she used a, um, a meditative form of, of therapy of being able, teaching her clients to connect what was going on up here with what is happening on a, on a physical realm. And, and as, an, as a anorexic, I had lost all sense of connection of mind, body, and spirit. None of the three of them were mm. working in tandem or there, and there was no flow. And I had no, I really was numb. I had no sense of um, if I was hungry or not hungry or how my body felt, where the pain was in my body. I, I had lost all sense of that. So she brought me back to that and uh, had me do a lot of work where um, basically just to give a little example, yeah. um, when I would be in the house by myself and I would be around trigger situations, let's say the refrigerator or the toilet or something, um, for a binge, um, she had me buy these little plastic blue dots from 
like, you know, the office supply store, put them on the trigger spaces. And when I saw these blue dots, I had to stop, sit down, whether it was three seconds or 30 seconds or however long I could handle it and locate the pain in my body and recognize and uh, be aware of its size, its shape, its feeling, its movement, its heat, its wow. light. I mean, I, and a lot of times for me, it was um, in like my low chest or my upper gut. That was where it was always. And for some people- like it, in here. Yeah. And some people, it's their shoulders or their traps or in their head or, you know, where they're, where, mm. but so when I, you know, first started that, I could only do it for, you know, three to five seconds. I mean, it was so uncomfortable to be connected to mm. what I was feeling. Mm. But she gave me the green light to, if you do this, then you can still go ahead with your binge or your purge or your st- whatever, whatever you're doing. So it was like, I'd never heard that before. Yeah. Like I was still allowed to, to, to act out on my eating disorder, which I did for many weeks, you yeah. know. But then the, the meditation space got longer and longer. And then all of a sudden one day I didn't want to binge and purge anymore. That's so like, smart. Okay. Yeah. It, she's it just, it was, it was a brilliant type of therapy for me, for sure. Wow. I mean, it just, so I became connected to myself again. And then we had lots of thoughts to work on. But that's an example of kind of how she worked. How long did the process take from when you started with her to when you weren't in your eating disorder anymore? Um, it took I, it took a couple of years until I was really, really well, mm. you know, and I felt like I could be in any scenario, any situation, and be rock solid. But mm. I got a lot better in about four or five months. But wow. then we we had still a lot of work to do where it was, yeah, where I really felt like I'm in absolutely no danger whatsoever of this reoccurring. That took a couple of years. Do you still have moments of struggle today when it comes to food or controlling portions ever? I have, I have no um, issues whatsoever around food at all. And I, I, I still go back to, I really put in the work and I, I, I'm aware that you can put in the work and relapse. I mean, you know, I, I did in the beginning with some of those other therapists, but for whatever reason, for me, putting all of that effort and all of that that energy and that work into it, I really was able to heal. And and today it's just, there's no any given time or minute or moment where I'm thinking about um, restriction or non-restriction or what types of food or when or how much yeah. or calories or counting or measuring. It's just it, that, 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 that dark space is over. It's just not a yeah. part of my life anymore. Yeah, just, and you. I can feel when I'm hungry now. It's just yeah, fantastic. So cool. like you should be able to. Were you, you weren't plant-based when you were no. going through this either. I feel like plant, being plant-based takes you to a whole nother level. Complete to new when, level of freedom for sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, so now let's talk we'll about your athleticism. How did you get into cycling, and when did it dawn on you that this was a calling and your path? Well, it, it, it never did dawn on me, okay. literally, until the Olympic podium. I'm not even kidding. Um, but I was I started cycling because my therapist, towards the end of my healing kind of journey or process, yeah. she, I think, recognized very early on that there was a competitor in me and, mm-hmm. and just knew that she wanted to get me back to that place somehow, no matter, not thinking I was going to do something professionally, but just be able to um, exercise in a really healthy yeah. way again. Because I, you know, many anorexics have o- over exercise as part of their disorder, and I certainly did. So she, you know, knew that. So in the beginning, we had to kind of taper that. But she, I think, wanted to get me back to a place where I could be, you know, just recreationally competitive, you know, I don't know, run a 5K or something. So yeah. she suggested that I pick some kind of outlet, some kind of sport, whatever it might be. I mean, I don't think she cared if it was like beach volleyball or gymnastics or cycling. So it's good I chose cycling because I would not have made it in the Olympics in beach volleyball or gymnastics. But, um, so I just... I mean, by, you would have been the tallest gymnast ever. And the oldest by like 30 years. So that would have been amazing. <laughs> Definitely would not have. You could have done it though. Okay. I believe you could have done it. If anybody There's could have done it, time. it was you. <laughs> Just shy of 50. Let me go. Oh Lord. So um, she, she, she suggested and I chose cycling just because I was out in Los Angeles and it's in sunny like pretty much every day. And I just thought, oh man, that sounds so good. I lived in Venice at the time to be able to ride up into the Santa Monica mountains 
and up and down PCH. It just, oh, it just, just seemed, it just sounded like ideal. It's so peaceful and beautiful. And um, so I lived on the, the East Coast for a long time in, yeah. in, in New York and it was, you know, kind of dreary and miserable. So I just was, I, I really affected by the sun and light. So I just thought, man, that's perfect. That is yeah. perfect. And if I run, I mean, how far am I really gonna be able to run? But if you cycle, right, you know, you can do 50 miles in yeah. you know, a couple hours. So, um, so I chose cycling and I just never stopped. I mean, literally, I just never stopped is, so is cool. what, like, it was not, I just, I just kept going. You were just doing various races and for yeah. fun and Yeah, like I started with and- um, the California AIDS ride because mm-hmm. I decided, I mean, I was better and, and I felt like, okay, like, you know, grow up and do something for, because by this time I'm, I'm 25 and I still feel like I've added nothing to the planet I've only been taking. So, um, I signed it, signed it for the California AIDS ride. We had to raise fifteen hundred dollars, which was like twenty thousand dollars to me. And it, and this was nineteen ninety eight, so I just thought I was going to die. I'm like, how in the world am I going to get this much money? But I raised it nice. and did the California AIDS ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles, which was like seven hundred miles because they don't go; it's not a straight shot. And I did it on a mountain bike with slick tires, and I just was like near the front most of the time. I, I think, I don't know how many people are on it, maybe a thousand. A lot of people are on it. You camp every night. Yeah. Um, and so at the end of that, the, some of the guys, because it was guys who I was riding with at, more at the front, they were like, you should probably try a race because this is like not, I don't think this is, we've not seen this I before. Love it. I, love I was it. like, oh, okay, where do I try a race? And they're like, well, you have to get a license. I was like, where do I get one of those? USACycling.com. So anyway, wow. I got a license and started Started racing. I didn't know that you had to get a license to do that. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, because they want your money, so you gotta get a <laughs> license. And in, in cycling, it, like other sports, but it's um, you have to start as a lower category and gain points to move your way up, mostly for safety. Okay. I mean, road cycling okay. is pretty, yeah. pretty, you know, can be pretty dangerous. Yeah. Um, so you start as a four and then move up to a three, two, one. So oh. I moved up to um, category one in like one calendar year, which is. Wow. Not common, so. So you never really felt the the love for it until you got to the Olympics. Oh no no no! I, I I fell in love in instantly. I okay. never felt like I was going to be at the top until I was. I mean, I never because wow. you know just coming from so where I had come love. from, it just I I loved it so much, and I was so challenged by it, and I was just so driven by seeing just what might happen if I just keep going. Because in the beginning, you know, they I ended up like the end of that year placing fourth at U.S. Nationals against all the best women in the country. And so that's when the U.S. National team was like, you know, invited me to come to the training nice. center to get tested and stuff. And I got tested physically. So VO2 max, watt bike test, lactate threshold. And they were like, you're old and you're like not, you're not really that talented. Like my, my sheer numbers are not that talented. They're, they're probably slightly better than the general public's, but they're not talented in terms of like Olympian status. Like I'm not... Physically, but this was just at the beginning, right? Well, I would have had similar. I mean, that's just like it's almost, you know, it's almost genetic what they're looking at. I so, see. so, um, so. Well, that's inspiring. Well, yeah, because it's you just never say never. I mean, yeah. I, and plus, what I had put my body through, like it really didn't right. make sense that it was um, answering in this way, and it really shows us, um, you know, our our, our bodies are extraordinary. Resilient. I mean, we are, but our, our physical bodies are truly, yeah. you know, they, I mean, we're regenerating, you know, billions of cells every day. So it was, it's, it's incredible to, to, um, for anyone to, can, to come back from anything, whether it's disease, right? right? Or um, an addiction or a disorder, like your, your body will, it'll come back if you allow it. When did you become pro and start making a living off of cycling? <laughs> <laughs> Never, no. Um, no. That's when you wish you picked beach volleyball. Uh, can you make a living off of beach volleyball? Yeah, more than you can on no. cycling. Really? Well, yeah, for sure the good ones do. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But not like the ball sports. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, cycling's niche, but it's not as niche as like, you know, weightlifting. So um, uh, 2000, 2002, yeah. Okay. It was, the, um, it was on um, T-Mobile, which was a, a big cycling team back in the day. And, uh, but I didn't make, I mean, you don't make very much money in the beginning at all. I mean, I'm talking like, you know, a thousand dollars a month. In the very beginning, less than that. What's the range mm. of what somebody can make in, in cycling? I mean, I have no idea. Well, it's more to do with um, the sponsors. So like just okay. your, 
team salary, we still do not, we're not anywhere close to parity between men's and women's salaries in cycling from their team. There's a required salary in the men's peloton um, at the highest level. And, and, and there's, they have just implemented a required one for females, but it's significantly like, it's a joke compared to sports like tennis that have parity and, you know, that, and, and we've been fighting for it. And, and a couple of women in the sport have done so much work to, to push good. it forward. Um, Catherine Bertine being the, the, the leader there, but it's still, we don't, we still don't have parity. So, I mean, the salaries were, I, I think my, my biggest salary ever was like Thirty thousand dollars a year, twenty twenty eight, twenty nine, something like that. Was so that with sponsors or without? That's just the salary from I your see. team, okay. and then you can go out and get, I see. Um, you know, ancillary sponsors. I see. How long was it from when you started to when you actually went pro? Like how many years for you to actually just make a couple. good salary? Okay, so yeah. a couple of years. That's yeah. not bad. When during your journey did you go vegan, and did you fear this would hinder your calling to cycling and ruin your career? Um, it, I thought it, there was a possibility that it, it could have. It was, um, it was about two and a half, three years, three years out from the Olympic Games, and I went to the 2012 Olympic Games. So I entered um, veganism via the route of ethics. I was, I, I saw what was happening behind closed doors yeah. in our food system, and I just was, you know, wrought with just anger. It really in the beginning, because I thought, well, this. W- some of the footage that I saw was. Um, in Spanish, and so I knew that it was not probably not here in the the United States. And I I remember coming home after seeing that and diving into a lot of research because I thought, oh, that's horrible. Yeah. But clearly, that doesn't happen in the United States because you know the government protects and serves its people, and that obviously includes animal agriculture and our food system and what what we're putting in our mouths. <laughs> no. So no. Uh, so I was just jolted into this is not something. I'm going to pay into anymore. This is just one of the worst injustices I think that this planet has ever seen. Um, the magnitude of it, the, the the sheer just misery of what's happening to so many of them every day, all day. And for what? Mm-hmm. For like a moment on our lips of, I guess, something that we think we enjoy. Exactly. So, so I just was um, just kind of catapulted into this is no longer going to be a part of my nutrition plan, any the animal foods. And so I didn't know. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I haven't made the Olympic team yet, right? You, 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 they, they name the team much closer to the games. And, but I was definitely on the path of potentially making the Olympic team. And I didn't really know exactly what would happen. My Australian coach, um, who's like an oversized crocodile Dundee, like back country, brilliant coach, but he was like, what are you doing? Like, this is not going to work out. You're already ancient. Because I was oh. 36 at the time. I love how you just uh, didn't care. You were like, well, yeah, I just, yeah. you know that sense, I had that sense of like, this is so much bigger than yes. any sporting event. Like, that's what the Olympics are. It's like yeah. a big sporting event. Yeah. It comes and goes. And just like anything else in our lives, you know, then it's in our rearview mirror. Yeah. And then what are you doing? Yeah. So I, if, I, if I'm going to be a party to this just to make an Olympic team, I thought I'll never be able to live with myself. Like that's yeah. not going to yeah. be part of who I, the structure of the being that I'm trying to be now. So, um, but I had, I, I had read the China study. So I, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to die, which is what some of the coaches were saying. You know, like you're going to perish. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to die, but I don't know if I can be a top end athlete. Like, that's the, that was the question. Five months before your 40th birthday, you went to the London Olympics. What was this experience like, and how did this become a reality? It was just, like, the coolest thing ever. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really, really... But I... That's... There are many, many wonderful things about aging. But I have to tell you, going to the Olympics at 39 and not 19, I had... Uh, incredible awareness that this mm-hmm. was probably not going to happen again and that I needed to just really be there. I had done a ton of mental work with my sports psychologist because I had horrible nerves that I had to work through in my career. Um, and imposter syndrome, which is just, mm-hmm. right, like just thinking that you don't belong and somebody's going to find you out at some point that you're not actually good at this and you've been like lying the whole time that you guys <laughs> So I just just completely soaked into everything that was the London Olympics and was just really present and really there. And I, I vividly remember 
um, almost every minute of the whole experience. And our wow. event was like in, in the middle, you know, Olympics are about two and a half weeks. Uh, and so, and it's over two days to you do qualifying in semis and then finals, if you make it that far. And um, I remember just the intensity of the crowds. We were, it was incredible to be a track cyclist at the London Olympics because this doesn't, it depends on where the country is that the Olympics games are in, whether yeah. your sport is popular or not. Right. Right. You can go like Beijing, uh, they've never heard of track cycling. So they had to pay people to be in the stands. No. Yeah. I heard it was just like depressing. But London, it's like track cycling is their religion. It was the hottest ticket in the town. All the royals were there. So it was just, it was outer body experience type of stuff. We raced the British for, for gold. I love that you had that. And so it was incredible. I mean, it was just, oh, it was, it was, it was just mind blowing to, when we raced for the gold, I remember like walking up on the track because my event's from a standing start. So you get clipped in and you have someone holding you. Okay. And, um. I remember walking up on the track and the whole track was moving because the British were just like beating down the track. And I remember thinking, I don't know if this is safe. Like, should I say something? Should we maybe not race? Because the, the, the whole building's getting ready to come down. I mean, the whole <laughs> building, it was crazy. It was just, it was just crazy. It was just the coolest thing. Were you super nervous or were you kind of like weirdly so nervous that you were calm? That, but I had worked really hard to get to that place because it wasn't natural for me to like, take my nerves and bring them into, like, I had to work so, so hard at that. But, um, you know, I, I learned to basically to get out over the imposter syndrome and over the nerves. Mm. I, I worked a lot with my sports psychologist on, um, what we called three minutes of opportunity because my events a little over three minutes. And instead of dreading it and feeling the, the misery and the fear that sets in, um, you know, the, the day before, the night before, the morning of, all of that, um, we turned it into three minutes of opportunity. Because it was, like, what yeah. an opportunity. I, you know, I mean, mm. there was a million, not a million, but a lot of women that would have liked to have been in my shoes. And to be aware of that and, and, and appreciate that and mm. say, I'm not going to go timidly, fearfully to the line. This is, this is our opportunity to shine. And this is our opportunity to represent the country and yeah. you know and you set a record kick ass we set an american record do you guys still hold that american record um yes but only because they increased the length of the event in the next olympics rio olympics from three kilometers to four kilometers okay so it because the men have always ridden four kilometers the men men's team pursuit has been in the olympics for like 20 years um but when they put women's team pursuit in they put it in as 3k because okay. we couldn't ride 4K, you know? Oh, it's like a little long. Oh, boy. Um, it's just, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, cycling in this pair. I mean, it's like a hilarious. It's, you just have to laugh or you just start crying. Oh, my goodness. So, but anyway, they finally put, it's the same now. So the next Olympics, it's 4 or 4K. Do you still keep in touch with your teammates? Yeah. Are they now vegan? Did you inspire them? Um, I, I, I may have. One of them is um, dairy-free. She has cool. a, an intense dairy allergy. Okay. Um, and is feels so much better. And, I mean, just to give you like a little bit of a picture of the pressure and and how much um, meat and dairy is infiltrated into the U.S. system um, and the U.S. Olympic Committee system, not only from trying to put put out their research, um, but also in sponsorship money. Um, the one teammate, um, Jenny Reed, had has been. Um, a high-level cyclist since she was like 16. So she always had um, pretty significant stomach cramping and bloating. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I came around and, and, and we met and we were um, roommates a lot, um, I said, Jenny, you got you need to go get tested for, for you know, some, for, for some allergies. Like you can't keep, the, you know, she, it just became her normal, which, you know, as we know, 65% of the world's population can't digest the, the, the lactose in cow's milk. So there, a lot of people are, are dealing with this issue. So she went to get tested and it came back that she had a gluten intolerance, which she also thought she knew, and a full-blown dairy allergy. She only took out the gluten because it's just, just so many years of being fearful of if I were to take out some animal foods, you know, at this point, she's only a couple of years from, from her from her third Olympic Games, and um, she's made a comeback. She was a sprinter before, so she's come over to an endurance event. She's the only one in history to be able to successfully even transfer over. So she had a Whoa. ton of pressure on her to even just make that transfer over, and it was too it was too scary because of all the 
BS that they'd indoctrinated into her head. Um, and so she kept eating, you know, a substance that she had an allergy to. So when, so after the Olympics, she retired too. And that's when she started taking it out and just like, it's almost changed her life. I mean, if you have a severe allergy, yeah. right? Like, and she feels amazing, amazing now. So wow. it's, it, it's, it's hard for a lot of athletes to, to lean into um, taking animal foods out of their diet, especially when they're young, because when you're younger and you're in the system, you don't really have a lot of that freedom, right? Like they're, they're, they're more, um, more controlled by the coaches and the trainers. Like, you know, you need to be eating this. You should be eating this. We're going to cook this for you. You have to eat this. And there's some really young athletes coming up in BMX, for example, who are, um, who are vegan and, 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 you know, some, some of them have to kind of hide it, sort of do it on the side. It's, it's just we're still not there yet where the, the, the education is at a high enough level and there's enough understanding that you can thrive and thrive at a really high level as an athlete. What made you start Switch for Good? And please tell us a little bit about your mission with it. Yeah. Well, Switch for Good um, is a, a, a nonprofit that, that, that I founded. And it started in uh, just last year, in the beginning of um, 2018. Uh, and it kind of is intertwined with what I was just speaking about, which is um, trying to unravel or turn the head on the belief that athletes need animal foods to thrive at a high level and produce, you know, really great performances. And so we put a um, seven vegan Olympians, uh, we put a commercial on the closing ceremonies of the 2018 Olympic Games Pyeongchang on NBC after the public had been listening to dairy commercials for three weeks and how excellent cow's milk is for you <laughs> to be able to do what you do out there. So um, th- that's really how we got started. I mean, it just, it, it got started from me being fed up, tired, frustrated, and just mad. Mm. Um, you know, it's just money, right? Always follow yeah. the dollar. Like, you know, the, the, the U.S. Um, and New Zealand are the only countries in the world that are not government-funded federations. So they have to rely on sponsors. So I can appreciate that, you yeah, know, and, and sometimes you have to take money from anywhere um, to be able to, to do what you do. So, um, you know, but they take a lot of money from, from the dairy industry. And um, just they've just perpetuated this miserable, ridiculous belief um, that we need the breast milk from a, the specific bovine species to be able to be great athletes. And so I, I just, I just it, it, it really Switch for Good was born out of me just having it, had, had enough. <laughs> you know, I'd had enough of like just big industry and telling us what we're, we're, we're supposed to eat and drink and, and people believing it. And I, I felt like I wanted athletes to have, um, you know, a vehicle for, uh, you know, an, another way, a, a new way forward. So Switch for Good is, is, does specifically focus on uh, dairy foods. And we're here to educate and embolden people to take back control of their health and their performance yeah. um, by, you know, leaving dairy in their wake and leading into plant foods. So you are so yeah. courageous and so bold. Well, hopefully I don't get like shot in the head one day while no, walking down the street. No, no, you should be commended for that. Uh, Not, I mean, it's so, they can find another way to make money. People are so smart and so resilient. Agreed, and agreed, and yeah. You don't have to hurt innocent beings to make a lot of money. You can make a lot of money in so many different areas. Yeah. That, that helps people. Yeah, exactly. With, um, the, with the plant-based, you know, obvious just, you know, rise of the foods, the plant foods and, and clean meats that are taking over, I right. see no reason why in maybe 10 years that um, the, the International Olympic Committee and the U.S. Olympic Committee can be sponsored by yeah. the healthy foods. Totally. To wrap it up, can you share the story of the rescue of the mama cow and her baby? So uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was became aware of a potential rescue that was going to happen in um, northeastern Pennsylvania of a uh, mother cow from a um, humanely raised, grass-fed, small uh, beef cattle farm like 15 cows, really, really small. And um, I connected with the person who was going to rescue these cows, trying to make a long story short. And so we ended up filming like a really short documentary about this process. But what was so extraordinary and heart-wrenching at the same time 
uh, and was very revealing is I think that so, so many of us, I mean, the, the human spirit in general wants to do good. Mm. We want to be good people. Mm. You know, we don't, we don't want to be causing harm and suffering ever. Mm. You know, and we, everyone would raise their hand and say, no, I don't want like my food to be tortured before mm. I put it on my plate. Um, that does not sit right with people. It's not okay. So um, the industry has created so many terms for us to feel better about what we're buying, right? The, you know, grass-fed, you know, massaged beef, that that's even a term just makes me insane. Um, and obviously, you know, humanely raised, you know, not right. spending time on that there's no humane slaughter, but, you know, that they're, right. you know, certainly cared for. So this rescue um, that we did was with um, a mother cow who had had 18 babies. This was her 18th baby that we were going to rescue with her. Um, How old was she? And uh, she turned 20 this last July. Wow. So she had lived on this on this farm um, and had given birth to 17 babies who were all drug away from her after about six months to go to a feedlot to go to slaughter. So that's just one example of even if she's eating really yummy grass, right. <laughs> she's having her babies d- drug away from her. And we know that happens in the dairy industry the first day. It's almost more sadistic that you are able to create this beautiful, of course, loving, comforting, incredible relationship with your child for six months. And then it gets you know, hauled away in a trunk never to be seen again. So she had been through 17 of those experiences. Meanwhile, this farm also... Um, Sometimes, not all the time, and I, I don't know why not all the time, um, but they slaughter their animals on, on the property there. Um, and uh, they, I, I did an interview with the, the owner of this property, the farmer, and he went into exquisite detail on um, how they kill them, which is stunning them and then slitting their throats and letting them bleed out because they don't want um, the blood to get into the, into the meat. So it's kosher. Um, I don't know if they sell it as kosher, but it's it was more for taste and flavor the way he was describing it to me. They didn't they don't want the blood. So he told me that they they do this out on the property. I mean, these cows are big, so they can't really take them anywhere else, you know. So and they don't trust them, so they don't follow they don't follow him. Uh, so they just go out right. He he brings somebody that's going to kill them right out on the property. Does it right so there? He pays for somebody else to kill them. Uh huh. And. He told me it takes about 17 to 18 minutes for them to bleed out. So they're struggling the whole time. That's pretty horrifying if you ask me. Meanwhile, their family, because they're all family members, because there's all sort of inbreeding going on there, um, are in a ceremonial cir- circle around the, 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 the cow that's bleeding out. Um, so that's just one story from your average, everyday, local, farm-raised, grass-fed, humane farm. It was shocking even to me. Like I knew the humane myth was kind of BS, but this was just so over the top of all of the scenarios that are, that are happening there, um, that are not at all what people think are happening. It's not what's going on at, at, you know, at at these farms. Are there a few, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't been to every humane farm. That is totally taking advantage of pure innocence in a sick, sick, sadistic way. Right. I don't understand how this is, this is, this is okay. This is legal. I just, yeah, I well, understand. that's a whole nother, I just right. don't, like how can a human be, it's like doing it to a special needs, it's like worse than doing it to a special needs human. They are yeah. completely helpless and so innocent yeah. and so aware. And in your hands, you know, for all, everything that they, you know, need to have and be take care of. The one thing that was really just got to me that I could see where there just was a dissonance with the farmer is after he told me this whole story, I said, well, when the cow finally dies, and I won't tell you how they dismember, it's, 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 it get, the, the, the story gets even more grotesque. But I said, what do the other cows do after yeah. this cow finally takes his last breath? He said, oh, he said, within like, you know, a couple of minutes, as long as we, you know, have hay in the other, they're eating. They're fine. It's like they're not. It's... I said, oh, that's interesting. We eat after funerals too. That is because you eat is right. not a sign right. that you're everything okay, is fine. Right. that everything's fine. Some people that actually your spirit eat isn't broken. Right. right. But it's like, that's, that, that's where yeah. he's like, you know, oh, they're eating, so they're fine. 
that's the lie he's telling himself to cope. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a journey. But anyway, yeah, Mama, um, whose name is uh, Penny's love, and her eighteenth no, sorry, it's the seventeenth baby, the the, the final one, um, Jimmy, are now at a sanctuary in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania called Indraloka. So the beauty is her final baby, Aww. her last one, she will spend the rest of her life with because I'm oh. sure she'll die before Jimmy because Jimmy's like two. And it is the most extraordinary experience to go spend time with them and the, and the rest of the cows because they have a whole herd there that are just, just fabulous that you're going to get to spend yeah, some time with me in November. But I can't even speak about the two of them without... Oh it just, goodness. it's just, and she has figured out probably within minutes after we got her there, uh, but definitely now that she's in a safe space oh. and that she is honored and respected and loved. As she should be. As she should be. Because she's a being. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ugh. Thank you for sharing your story too, because I know it can be really hard to relive painful times and to share it repetitively, but I know you're doing it for the animals and for people who are in pain. And you're so, you're so courageous, Dotsie. And I love so you, much your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here with us and, and being so, so strong and courageous. Thank love you. you friend. Thanks for doing what you do. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love Gianna. And Dotsie.